be outdone by Barbara, we set ourselves another challenge, uh, notably a duo Pecha Kucha talk. Um, I'll do the first bit. Um, we will be talking about um, portable antiquities, uh, to be more precise, non-ferrous metalwork, in, um, in the North Sea uh, context, early medieval North Sea connections. And of course, no one will argue uh, that there were no, no North Sea connections uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, early Middle Ages. Um, to the contrary, we know very well uh, that uh, contacts were, were uh, very intense already from the migration period onwards and that these continued from the 5th to 7th centuries and, uh, and even intensified in the 8th and 9th centuries with a very uh, widespread uh, trading network um, that, uh, well, through which uh, numerous commodities were traded, which was based at a number of major trading hubs throughout the North Sea area. However, what I uh, will do in my half of the Pecha Kucha talk is uh, look at uh, how non-ferrous metalwork from coastal Flanders and notably metal detected artifacts add a new understanding of this very small region within the North Sea area um, within, as, as, uh, as part of that, that broader uh, connected and interconnected region. And for instance, we can start looking at how um, brooches and dress accessories uh, um, are, are reflecting, uh, for instance, in this case, an, an expanding uh, Frisian trading identity. Um, uh, influence from the north, com commerce from the north, that has an impact on material culture in a broad sense, in the way people dressed, um, in the way uh, people uh, used other material culture. So these, this metalwork is um, uh, really quite well uh, reflected or reflects well other trends in material culture that we can see, such as here import uh, pottery uh, along the coast from uh, uh, east to west uh, in the uh, um, coastal Flanders. And this, of course, ties it into the much broader picture. So what we see here is the map that Richard Hodges already used to illustrate these Frankish and Frisian, uh, what he saw as Frankish and Frisian uh, spheres of influence. Uh, and thanks to coastal, uh, uh, thanks to uh, metalwork rather in coastal Flanders, we can start to understand this cultural boundary in a more dynamic way. It, doesn't, it didn't stop at the end of the Carolingian period either. We see how, uh, within the context of the county of Flanders, uh, the elite of the count, the, the riding elites, his, his knights, were using um, uh, dress accessories and uh, horse riding gear that was inspired by or even copied. Uh, examples from the Anglo-Danish world, and the same is true for the women. They were wearing brooches uh, that reflect in style, in iconography, in uh, broader visual schemes, very much what was happening in the wider North Sea world. So on numerous levels, we have this integration. Thanks to metalwork, we get a much better grasp uh, on integration in the North Sea world. And this is our transition slide uh, <laughs> to go over to Alison. <laughs> right. Um, so. We know about the growing potential of metalwork, which is very exciting, I think, for all of us. So we have schemes in operation in Flanders, and many of you will know about the Portable Antiquities Scheme in England as well. Um, joining these are DIMA, or DIME, in Denmark, and Pan Portable Antiquities of the Netherlands. Now, these schemes are part of a growing movement around the North Sea to encourage the reporting and recording of all metal-detected finds. And one of the reasons that this is really exciting is because it enables us to look beyond regional boundaries to study patterns at an international, transnational scale. So because of this, last year the University of York funded a pilot project designed to test the feasibility of such a cross-border analysis. So we were focusing on the pre-Viking and Viking periods. We selected case studies from across England, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Flanders and compared different artifact subtypes um, coming from the types of uh, brooches, coins, and um, a couple of other artifacts. So we wanted to focus in particular on items that might be considered imports or items that were deriving influence from other items. Now, this provides us with quantitative bases from which we can begin to think about bigger questions. And what we've really been finding is that, in fact, even though we're looking at the Viking Age, of course, not everything was about the Vikings, um, very much the opposite. So you're seeing examples of brooches here that really have um, probably very little to do with the Vikings in particular, and yet we're finding them across all the study regions that we're looking at in these periods. So 
So <laughs> in the Viking Age, um, of course, there is a lot of strong evidence for Scandinavian influences. And we can see this through uh, movement of peoples, ideas, and also goods. So items like these, we see these throughout the North Sea. Um, but then we do have areas like Frisia, which are historically attested, areas that were impacted by the Vikings, and we see very few um, types of evidence like that. Now this map illustrates some of the different connections that we're ma mapping out based on the artifacts that we've been studying. Um, and some interesting patterns are coming out. Of course, we need to pull down a lot of these lines and think about the directions of movement, not just the fact that they were moving from one place ultimately to another. So the questions and ideas that I presented here really focus specifically on the material, and what we want to do is to explore these ideas and much more in the future. So taking the metalwork as just a starting point, we want to tap into many of the deeper themes that are concerning the people of the North Sea and movement. And we would like to thank these organizations and institutions. Thank and thanks, you. Reese.